The 8th election was held on the 13th of December 1919. Last time we saw Billy Hughes get expelled from the Labour Party over the issue of conscription, only for him to come back round and annihilate the party in the election of 1917. Shortly after being re-elected, Hughes brought forward a second referendum on changing the conscription laws again, asking Australia if they wanted conscripts to be deployable in foreign operations, even going as far as promising to resign in the event of another no vote. Again, the result said no, and by a much larger number than the first referendum. So, only seven months into his second term, Hughes resigned as Prime Minister. However, since there was no alternative candidates, the Governor-General, Munro Ferguson, immediately recommissioned Hughes to the role of PM. Despite a defeat of both referendums, the debate sparked a recruitment drive and Australia found itself able to reinforce its dwindling numbers in the European theatres. Despite leading Australia against the retreating central powers, Hughes was facing challenges at home. A new group of state-based parties had now emerged on the federal scene, the country parties today known as the Nationals. They originated in Western Australia, but soon had parties all across the country, and had their eyes on taking the rural seats held by Hughes' Nationalists, who were losing popularity with the people there due to the war-based tariffs and price control policies of Hughes. This led to the Swan by-election in 1918 to replace deceased member Sir John Forrest. In this election, the Country Party and the Nationalist Party spoiled each other's ballots, leading to the unexpected victory of Labour candidate Edwin Corboy, the youngest elected member of Parliament until 2010 at the age of 22 years old. Huh, that's my age. This resulted in the immediate implementation of a preferential voting system, also known as ranked choice voting, to replace the first past the post system which had been used for all previous elections. This would now be the official way to elect federal parliamentarians, which is still in effect to this day. On the 11th of November 1918, the First World War would come to an end with the signing of the armistice. The following year, Hughes would travel to France, along with other allied leaders, to write out the controversial Treaty of Versailles. During the conference, Hughes was determined to get the most war reparations he could, demanding a staggering $24 billion at the time off Germany to be given to the Allies, along with the full annexation of all occupied German Pacific territories to Australia's control. Hughes' aggressive proposals caused him to clash with other members of the conference, including US President Woodrow Wilson, who Hughes got into an argument over due to the fact that more Australians had died during the war than Americans. However, the biggest disagreement Hughes would have would be against the Japanese. When Australia invaded German New Guinea, Japan simultaneously invaded the other German Pacific holdings, including the Marshall and Caroline Islands, and like Australia, also wanted them annexed into their nation. Along with this, Japan also brought forward to the conference the Racial Equality Proposal, which sought to give Japanese people the same societal status as white people. Hughes was massively concerned with the growing power of the Japanese Empire, and was worried that the proposal of racial equality would mean the end of the white Australian policy, as Japanese people would now be considered white, thus allowing them to enter the country freely. Hughes, along with the United States, would successfully reject this proposal. I'm sure they won't hold that against us in 20 years time or something. Despite making several international enemies, Hughes would return home from the conference as an Australian hero, where he got his now famous nickname, the Little Digger, which was a reference to his size and the Australian troops, which got the name Diggers after shoveling out all the trenches during World War I. On the other side of politics, Labour for their part had still not recovered from their loss two years ago. Frank Tudor remained leader of the party but was largely seen as an ineffective opposition figure to Hughes' nationalist government, and now with the preferential voting system, he could no longer hope to pick up seats via spoiled ballots. He was also experiencing decaying health. And the winner was... Billy Hughes and the Nationalists with 37 seats. Was there really any doubt? Also, with the introduction of preferential voting, we now have to measure the two party preferred, which measures the support behind the top two parties, after all other parties have been eliminated. And here Hughes won again, with a combined total of 54.10%, despite only getting 45% in the first preferences. Although Hughes lost 16 seats, primarily due to the Country Party, still with the largest share of seats, and with the Country Party and their 11 seats vehemently opposed to allying with Labour, Hughes had ensured that he would be the Prime Minister for the next three years. Despite coming second, Labour was by far the biggest loser in this election, picking up a mere four seats to now have 26, but still 12 seats short of the majority. With 45.9% of the two-party preferred vote, Labour began the process to replace Tudor as leader of the party shortly after the election, as it was clear Labour needed a new direction if they ever hoped to lead the country again. Tudor would be the first opposition leader in Australian history to never become Prime Minister. Hughes had demonstrated himself as a very successful wartime leader, but with the war over, he would now need to demonstrate how well he could handle a country at peace. Come back next time for the election of 1922.